How's it going, everyone? Today is the anniversary of the end of the First World War. So what this video is going to be on is technological advancements that really defined not just the First World War, but warfare onward and, and how that was such a key event and how there were certain key technological advancements. Usually when people talk about the First World War and what technology defined it, they talk about three things, right? They talk about the artillery shell, the machine gun, and chemical weapons. And we'll talk about all three of these, but we're really going to focus on the artillery shell because I mean, one thing, it, it still defines warfare uh, to, to a great extent with the way it was used in the First World War. And we'll see how these other technologies, they, they really played a role either in the advancement of uh, how artillery was used or the use of artillery affected these other technologies. So when, when we talk about artillery, okay, as long as humans have existed, as long as warfare has existed, there has been an advantage to hitting a target from a distance from which the target cannot hit you. Okay, so being able to outrange your opponents, even in hand-to-hand -hand combat. If you can, if you have, if you're taller, if you have longer limbs, you can reach farther, right? So you can punch an opponent from a distance from which they cannot reach you. You can grab them from a distance from which they cannot reach you. And moving forward, we we started throwing stones and, and launching stones with slings. And then we had crossbows and longbows and, and uh, catapults and trebuchets. There's the, the famous ancient story of David versus Goliath, which among many things, it's about the advantages of a ranged weapon over a melee weapon. And at one point, we have the invention of gunpowder. Okay. And what gunpowder does, it, it creates an explosion, right? And what does an explosion do? It pushes air in all directions. And that shockwave of air flying, what can it do? Well, it can push other things, whatever it interacts with. Okay. So with the ability to create these kind of controlled explosions you can create rockets right and you can invent guns or cannons which are just long guns right so if you have a pipe right that's meant to fly in a certain direction and you create combustion inside that pipe right well that shockwave that gas is forced outside of the exhaust the opening at the end and it forces the rest of the rocket, the physical hard part of it, to move in the opposite direction. And so we call that forward. As the exhaust flies back, the rocket flies forward, right? So this is ammunition that, that propels itself. In the case of a gun, okay, typically what people think of when they, they think artillery, right? A cannon, okay, you have an explosion that happens at the back and the ammunition which is loaded is forced out right as the gas has to escape and and because of the structure of the cannon it's forced to escape from this end and so that cannon ball right or the bullet if we're talking about a gun is forced outward and there is a force pushing the cannon back as well right for a gun you call that recoil and there's different technologies made to keep cannon stationary to keep artillery stationary or not moving too much uh, when when the firing happens right so initially the the idea behind this ammunition is that it is a hard solid object that hits something and damages it by breaking it by making a, a large hole in the structure and so on and then came the idea of the bomb shell okay so the thing being fired isn't just a hard solid object but it is itself an explosive and how it's typically drawn right in cartoons is you have your fuse you have your large object and once the fuse runs out this ammunition explodes okay so what's going on in the inside is you have this hard shell which is a delivery mechanism for the explosive right and the explosive is on the inside right so this can be fired at an enemy 
and once the fuse runs out, well then the explosion happens. And the purpose of this hard shell on the outside is to deliver that explosive, right? to deliver that bomb, more so than just to make damage by hitting something, which was the idea of the cannonball. Right? So this was called the bomb shell. It's a shell within which there is an explosive, right? This is, this is a bomb. Uh, so first it was called bomb shell, and then it was shortened to just shell, okay, artillery shell, as these became more advanced. And the term bomb shell is still used, but it's used to refer to something that just appears out of nowhere and, and really changes things and, and has this shocking effect. Uh, for example, in the news, some new story appears that really changes, say, uh, the political spectrum. People call it it's a bombshell. It's surprising. It came out of nowhere. It changes everything. It has a shock to it. That's where that term bombshell comes from. Uh, and the less cartoonish, more common bombshell, although it's usually not called like this, is the grenade, right? So that shape of the grenade, you see it's, it's similar, right? You have the the round-ish structure within which it, there is the explosive, and then you have this uh, top part sticking out where the fuse is. Of course, for a grenade, the fuse is, is more advanced, right? But the idea is the same. You have a casing within which there's an explosive, and there's a fuse that can make that explosive go off. The word grenade is actually related to the word pomegranate, the granite part of pomegranate because it looks like a pomegranate right it's round and has that top part and it has a, a shell on the outside and on the inside there's there's a uh, sections just like with a pomegranate in some languages today the word for pomegranate and the word for grenade is the exact same word so this technology had certain limitations which is it will not explode until the fuse runs out and that is the only time when it would explode, right? So when firing it, right, you would want it to land before it explodes. So the explosion happens where your target is. And sometimes that wouldn't be the case, okay? If you fire too far, too high, it's in the air for too long, the explosion would actually happen in the air, which is not what the weapon was intended for. In the American National Anthem, there's the lyrics, the bombs bursting in air, right? Why would the bombs be bursting in the air? Well, because that was something that would happen in warfare at the time that that poem was written. And the length of the fuse created a constraint on how far you can launch the bombshell. Okay? Because if you launch it such that it travels through the air for too long, well, then it's going to explode before it hits the target. So. This existed long before the First World War, right? So what changed during the First World War was advances in working with metal, okay, allowed people to create the kind of shells or bomb shells that we see today, usually when people think of, uh, of a shell, of an artillery shell, right? So it has this shape, right, and it flies in this direction, right? It's a more aerodynamic shape, like a dart, right? It has a front part, which leads the way. And this allowed for much more, uh, much, much more developed what are called percussion shells, right? So it explodes not when a certain time goes by, but when a certain part of it is hit, right? So when the front, for example, makes contact with the target, well, then the explosion happens, okay? And if you can control how, in what orientation, your shell is flying, well, then you can create a much more effective percussion shell. So these advancements, shortly before World War I, okay, allowed shells to explode on target, at least most of the time, which allowed them to be fired farther, and other advancements in, uh, in working with metal allowed uh, allowed them to be launched farther as well without the, the launching mechanism breaking or without the shell itself breaking because the casing, right, that casing of the shell has to be strong enough to withstand the explosion which causes the, the bomb to be launched in the first place, right? So all of these advancements made artillery and the percussion shell much more advanced. So now you could far, 
fire farther away and it's pretty much guaranteed that that it will explode when it hits the target unexploded shells from past wars are still found once in a while and you have to be very careful right around it so you don't accidentally cause the the trigger mechanism to 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 go off right so so professionals take care of that in, in the rare cases when these unexploded shells are found so you have now a situation where an enemy can be hit for much farther away okay and this creates another problem which is how do you know you hit the enemy okay if the enemy is so far away that you cannot see them how do you know that they're being hit now this could be used to your advantage for example if there's a hill okay and the enemy is here and your artillery is being launched from here well you can hit the enemy without the enemy being able to hit you right without being able to see you but how do you know where the enemy is how do you know if your shots are hitting or not and so you need reconnaissance right you need someone closer to the enemy okay who's spying on them effectively and telling you okay you're you're firing too far you're aiming too close too much to the east too much to the west and so on okay and this is before the days of, of radio okay every soldier carrying around radio is a very new thing in history so the person would have to be able to crawl sneakingly to where the artillery is landing observe what's going on then crawl back communicate or sneak back communicate okay what needs to be changed then sneak back again once again communicate uh, well observe how uh, how the shots are landing and then and then go back again so going back and forth communicating how aiming should be changed right and this is a difficult task and it's a dangerous task right and with artillery firing even farther it's an even more difficult task because the the person directing this aiming has to travel even farther each time they're sneaking back and forth and it became an even more difficult task in world war one because of machine guns okay so a machine gun was a very powerful defensive weapon because okay let's say you have your machine gun set up here and it can move around right say comfortably with such an angle and it can spray ammunition very quickly over this entire area okay which makes it very difficult to approach this location and if you have a few machine guns set up doing this sort of thing well then you just have this this wall of bullets turned on whenever the person setting up this defense wants to turn it on and it makes it again very very difficult to approach a certain location so what would happen in the first world war is people would set up armies would set up trenches okay so this is a bird's eye view here they would set up trenches and machine guns would be on the edges of these trenches it would be very difficult to approach these trenches okay so looking at it from the side there's your trench okay if someone is firing they cannot get most of that trench right unless they move closer right if they're even farther away well then there's even less of the trench that they can hit right and if there's machine guns set up here okay making it dangerous to to approach close to the trench the trench is this useful defensive structure okay? so say artillery is firing at a trench or it's firing at military positions that are somewhere behind a trench right you have to know where that trench is you have to know if the artillery is hitting it or not so you need someone close by and being close by is dangerous right so you need new methods of reconnaissance okay and airplanes were invented shortly before the first world war and they were a useful method of reconnaissance right so rather than having people approach in this very dangerous ground situation you just fly high above right in your airplane and observe where the enemy trenches where is the artillery hitting where is our artillery not hitting and so on and you can fly even further and observe even more enemy positions using airplanes for reconnaissance of course 
Sure, that, that solves the problem of, of aiming your artillery far away, but the enemy has its own reconnaissance airplanes, and it might be difficult for them to shoot at your airplanes from the ground, but they can shoot at your airplanes from their airplanes, right? So pilots would start bringing weapons on board, like handguns, to fire at the enemy's reconnaissance planes, to interfere with the enemy's reconnaissance, to interfere with the enemy's artillery fire. So there, there were handguns brought on board, there would be bricks brought on board to drop on the enemy from, uh, from above, and eventually this was incorporated into the aircraft, where guns would actually be mounted on the aircraft. The, the, the gun would be part of the aircraft to shoot at other aircraft. In the Second World War, we have much more um, of aircraft shooting at ground targets. We have, uh, we have bombs being dropped from aircraft. And of course, an aircraft can carry a bomb farther than artillery at this point in technological advancement, but that puts the pilot at risk, right? Whereas artillery can fire a bomb far away without putting the pilot at risk. So we have advances in artillery, in the artillery shell, leading to advances in aircraft specifically combat aircraft and strategies involving combat aircraft. Okay? And part of that has to do with the machine gun making it difficult for an individual on the ground doing reconnaissance uh, and just the range of the, the uh, artillery making it difficult for an individual doing reconnaissance. And eventually the tank was invented also in the First World War to deal with this problem of trenches and machine guns. So uh, the tank, an armored vehicle, the idea was a vehicle that can withstand machine gun fire and drive over top of a trench, right? Eliminating that defensive structure that a trench with machine guns creates, okay? Uh, we talked about, uh, we mentioned chemical weapons, right? It was a defining feature in the First World War. So if the bombshell is fitted rather than just an explosive with a chemical weapon and it lands in a trench, well, that gas moves slowly, right? Which works for a stationary target, like a trench, a target where people cannot escape very easily, right? Because their, their movement is limited to by the direction of the trench and, uh, and the height of the trench. And so that was the purpose of the application of chemical weapons other than to, like, like all weapons, there's, a, there's an idea to demoralize the enemy, to scare the enemy. The tactical purpose is to make trenches ineffective by killing the people manning the trenches or by forcing them to flee. So the usefulness of chemical weapons, again, depends on the advancement of the artillery shell and the ability to fire artillery far away that the spreading chemicals won't affect your own troops or are much less likely to affect your own troops. So what happens after the First World War? Well, what the First World War showed was that bullets from machine guns right, are, are a very useful tool in warfare. Artillery shells are a very, very useful tool in warfare. What you saw towards the end of the First World War was actually artillery was fired so far, so high up, that it ended up entering the stratosphere. So a part of the atmosphere that's a, that's a higher layer above the ozone layer, okay, higher than where airplanes fly. And the higher you go in the atmosphere, the thinner the air is, okay? In the stratosphere, the air is much, much thinner than it is in close to the ground. And so rather than following the same parabolic trajectory that it would follow if it was uh, traveling through a medium without much changing uh, air density, right? The shell can travel much farther, okay? And what happened was there was, there was one bombardment where this was used. It was a, a German bombardment of Paris where explosions would start happening in Paris, but there were no German positions anywhere near Paris. 
Okay, now these, these cannons firing these shells were actually about 70 miles away. Okay, very, very far. Right, so, so people really started to panic, right? There's explosion happening. There's no enemy positions nearby. Okay, what's going on? Okay, and those, uh, those explosions were from artillery shells that were flying higher up in the atmosphere that, uh, that there was so little air resistance that they could travel so far. Okay, so, so you have this change in, in warfare where you can hit an enemy that is so far away. You can be hit as well by an enemy that's so far away. And here's the thing with shells and with, with bullets, okay? They're only used once, right? You can't reuse them. It's not like a sword and shield where you can use the same one throughout the whole course of the war and the next war you use them again. No, you have to keep having access to new ones, right? So you have to keep producing them. Where are they produced? At a factory, okay? So having operating factories, producing your ammunitions, is a key component of modern warfare. Where are the factories situated? Where people live, where people can work at the factories. They're situated in cities, right? So now cities become military targets. So now you have armies trying to target cities of their opponents so that those opponents can no longer produce ammunition. Well, your weapons might not be accurate enough to hit the actual building where the factory is, or you might not know where the factory building is. And what was figured out during the Second World War is, well, why not just disable the whole city? We don't need to know where the factory is in the city, right? If, if enough bridges are destroyed, enough roads are destroyed, enough heaps of rubble in people's way uh, are, are there, well, then the city cannot operate as an economic unit. And so that factory cannot operate either. Even if there's no destruction to the factory and there's no casualties caused to people who work at the factory, then enough harm to the city can still create a situation where that factory either cannot operate at all or cannot operate to the same capacity. And what you saw in the Second World War was carpet bombing of cities. And there's the destroying enemy morale goal to that as well, but it, it didn't work that well because oftentimes people would just unite against the enemy that's bombing their cities. But in terms of making cities not able to produce ammunition, okay, that strategic goal, well, that was still going on. The problem with that was that, well, it required a lot of bombs and it required a lot of airplanes in the sky for a long period of time, which put a lot of pilots at risk. And countries in World War II wanted a solution to that. And one solution was, well, what if we create one really powerful bomb. So we just have to send one airplane to drop just one bomb and that'll have the same destructive power, the same ability to destroy a city's ability to operate, at least economically, this, this, with, to the same extent that can be achieved with many, many bombs, many, many airplanes, right? So, so achieve the same thing, but putting a lot less pilots' lives at risk, right? And this was the nuclear weapon. Right? And it's strange to think of nuclear weapons as being built to save lives, but the destructive power of the nuclear weapons used in World War II, that destructive power was already being achieved with aerial bombardment. Okay, by the Americans of Japanese cities, of German cities, it was already achieved before nuclear weapons, just with a lot more airplanes flying for a much longer period of time, putting a lot more pilots' lives at risk. Right, so the nuclear weapon it, the, the idea, one of the ideas there was, was to reduce pilot casualties. So you have nuclear weapons that are developed and they trace their strategic origin again back to these advances in artillery. And then you have the Cold War, by which point we have, I mean, if you, if you give you know, a propulsion system to your artillery, well, now it's a rocket. Okay, it has a rocket engine, it can propel itself, give it a guidance system, it can steer towards a particular target better. And if you launch it higher and higher and higher to higher and higher layers of the atmosphere, well, eventually you get to space. Okay, and once you get to space, well, then there is 
no air resistance, right? So you can you can fire even farther. By the way, that German bombardment of Paris, it was so high up, they actually had to take the curve, the rotation of the Earth into consideration when aiming this weapon. Okay? And by the time the Cold War rolls around, okay, now you have rockets that are so advanced, you can launch them from any point on Earth, right? They get so high up that they're in space, and you can calculate so that they fall to any point on Earth, okay? And these are intercontinental ballistic missiles, okay? Intercontinental, because they can travel between continents. This, you know, circle here is supposed to be the Earth. And ballistic, because they fall onto their target. So artillery, or the strategic purpose of artillery, if you can call it artillery, even though it's a, it's a rocket, that goes into space, it, it becomes so advanced that you can fire from any point on Earth and hit any point on Earth. So what do you do about reconnaissance? How can you observe what's going on on enemy territory? Well, you do that from space as well. Okay, so now you have the space race, right? So now the idea is the same, an eye in the sky. It's like airplanes doing reconnaissance in World War One. But just making that more advanced, higher and higher and higher, now you're doing reconnaissance from space. Same idea. It all started with those technological advancements that defined World War I. I hope that helps understand uh, how the nature of warfare changed to be what it is in modern days. And I'll see you next time.